Good morning. I'm Francis Sue, past president of MAA and also a professor uh, at Harvey Mudd College. And while I was not involved in selecting today's speaker, I am very pleased you'll get a chance to hear her. Maria Clave is president of Harvey Mudd College and also a mathematician and computer scientist. She earned her PhD from the University of Alberta and held positions at the University of Toronto, IBM Research, and the University of British Columbia before becoming a dean at UBC and at Princeton, and then taking on the presidency at Harvey Mudd College. Even so, she remains an active member of the math community. She's a trustee for MSRI on, and on the board for Math for America, and is an AMS fellow. Maria has an accomplished research record in functional analysis, discrete mathematics, theoretical computer science, human-computer interaction, and gender issues in information technology and interactive multimedia for mathematics education. And I'll tell you a story. A few years ago, I was working on a research problem, and there was a piece of the problem I couldn't prove. And my colleague, Art Benjamin, said, you should talk to Maria. She's really good at that kind of problem. And I thought, well, you know, skeptical she had any time for this kind of thing because she's a college president. But I asked her anyways, and she said, thank you for sending me this problem. I'm not traveling this weekend because I have the flu, and this will get my mind off of it. <laughs> and a few days later, she had filled in the missing gap, and we had a paper. So it's actually because of Maria that my Erdős number has been lowered to two. <laughs> Under Maria's leadership, Harvey Mudd College has changed dramatically. We have faculty who are more committed to inclusive teaching, we have a student body that now looks like the demographics of California, a diversity that has traditionally been hard for science and engineering schools to achieve. Maria is bold, energetic, and inspirational, and I'm pleased to introduce her. Please welcome President Maria Clave. All about that. So first of all, um, it's really nice to be here. Um, I'm feeling a lot like a fraud. This is actually very common in my life. So the, the reasons I feel like a fraud uh, right today is that first of all, there is no mathematics in my talk. My apologies. And secondly, all of the work that I'm, I'm gonna talk about and tell you about today, I had nothing to do with. So having said that, um, let me show you the outline for the talk. So I'm going to start by talking about the representation of women in bachelor uh, programs in mathematically intensive disciplines. I'm going to tell you my hypothesis. I'm going to tell you a bit about Harvey Mudd College and particularly about the work that um, several of our departments have been doing to increase the participation of women in areas like computer science, physics, and engineering. And then for those of you who already know about Harvey Mudd College, you probably, as you listen to this talk, you'll go, well, of course you could do that at Harvey Mudd. I mean, you're a tiny place. You have a woman as a president. You have a female mathematician, computer scientist as a president. Of course you could do all of this stuff. And and, and so, you know, one of the points that I want to make is that the things that have happened at Harvey Mudd, they can happen at other institutions too. And in fact, I'll close with telling you about the BRAID project, which is a joint uh, effort between the Anita Borg, anita.b.org, uh, used to be the Anita Borg Institute for Women in Technology. They rebranded last year, and I just can't <laughs> get anita.b.org in, into my tongue. But in any case, jointly between Harvey Mudd and anita.b.org, working with about 25 computer science departments across Canada and the US, mostly in the US. Okay, so um, computer science is the only discipline that I know of where the participation by women has gone backwards in the last 35 years instead of forwards. So when I was a math major a very long time ago, the percentage of math majors who were female was about 
And by the time I got my PhD, the percentage of PhDs that were in math that were going to women was about 9%. And those numbers have gone up dramatically. And for the last couple of decades, the percentage of bachelor's degrees going, uh, being given in mathematics and statistics was somewhere between 40 and 45%. The numbers for computer science, engineering, and physics are quite different. So for computer science, 35 years ago, the numbers were in the mid 30%. And for the last decade, they have been somewhere between 11 and 15%. For engineering, the numbers 35 years ago were down at probably the two or 3%. They rose to uh, perhaps about 21%, but they've fallen off slightly and they're now at about 18%. And similarly for physics, they grew to the low 20s and they're now back at 19%. And the interesting thing is that if you ask, you know, people who've been faculty members in computer science or engineering or uh, physics, uh, who are, have been faculty members, you know, for, who are roughly, let's say, my age, which is 66, They'll, they'll often tell you, well, it's because we have a lot of math in our dis discipline and women don't like math or women aren't good at math. Well, that is clearly baloney. <laughs> because if over 40% of the degrees in math and statistics are, are going to women, that is not why women are not present in physics, engineering, and computer science. So here's the hypothesis. If we teach rigorous mathematical content so that students explore applications of the concepts in addition to theory, students collaborate and help each other, and students believe that all who work hard and get help will succeed, then not only will more women be attracted to the discipline, but many more students will achieve better learning outcomes. Now, I believe in this hypothesis. There's a part of me that doesn't like it. So what do I not like about it? I love math. And I love math for its abstractions, for its structures, for its patterns, for its beauty. I don't love math because of its applications. And, and so there's a part of me that is just finds it hard in my heart of hearts to say that we will have people understand complex mathematical ideas, proofs, etc., by exposing them to applications. But we have some data to support our hypothesis. So uh, first of all, not all students will like the new course better, but most will. And I have some experience with this. As I said, all of the work I'm talking about, I didn't do. It was done by faculty at Harvey Mudd College. But I did get involved in doing very similar things while I was at the University of British Columbia and while I was uh, Dean of Engineering at Princeton. And in both cases, I was teaching a course that uh, it was well known that many of our students did not like. And one of the ways that I addressed it was adding well, I mean, I did things like throw candy at students who ask questions. Um, I did a lot of active learning kinds of things, but I also introduced some applications. And when I got my reviews, I would have about 20% of the students who would say, this is beautiful mathematics. Why are you screwing it up with all this other stuff? And then I would have the other 80% of the students doing the teaching evaluation saying, thank you so much. I loved this course. I was really scared to take it because I know we have to do proofs and so on. But it was so much fun. Second caveat is that when you, it actually takes a fair amount of work to get it right. And in particular, if, as in the case of our engineering department, you actually do real experiments, not just simulations, um, it can actually be very expensive just in terms of the resources that it takes to offer labs. And as I said, I did none of this work. Okay, so raise your hand if you knew about Harvey Mudd College before coming to this talk. 
Oh my goodness, I have never ever gotten that kind of response. That is so cool. Okay, well, um, I, whenever I, t I, I give talks, I do talk a little bit about Har Harvey Mudd. I was in the elevator writing down the Marriott and the woman looked at my t-shirt and she said, Harvey Mudd, is that a, are you in the Ar Ivy League? And I'm going like, no. <laughs> so uh, we are a very small college. We have currently, I believe it's 844 students. We are a liberal arts college, but we, virtually all of our students major in some area of science and engineering. We're one of five undergraduate colleges in Claremont, California. Um, ah, I had an Ivy League on my slide. That's probably why she thought that. Um, our students are extraordinary. As my husband Nick said in our first year after we moved to Harvey Mudd from Princeton, he said, there's no such thing as a student at Harvey Mudd who is not exceptional. Um, we have the most amazing faculty I've ever worked with in my life. They really, to, pretty much to a person, they care more about the education of our students than about their own careers. Uh, we're a relatively young college. We're a little bit more than uh, 60 years old. For, we were founded as a co-ed college, and the joke is that uh, the founding president, Joe Platt, was in a discussion with the board about whether it should be a men's college or a co-ed college. And uh, several of the trustees were pushing very hard for it to be a men's college. And one of them said to Joe, who would ever want to marry a female mathematician? <laughs> and Joe looked right back at this person and said, I did, which was true. His <laughs> wife was a mathematician. And um, as a female mathematician, I take that very seriously. So when we were founded as co-ed, but there was a limit on the percentage of our student body who could be female of 11%, one one. Why would you pick 11%? I have no idea. And that um, limit on the number of women, uh, the percentage of women was in place until 1971. And you know, one of the things that our college has been working on uh, for at least a decade before I arrived as president, I'm in, I started July 2006, so I'm in, in my 12th year, which is really hard for me to believe, um, but had been working on attracting more women and more people of color. And we are now essentially gender balanced. Um, our incoming class this year was 52% female. We have been hovering around 48% female. I believe we're actually very close to being gender balanced right now. But we're also, we have a lot of women on our faculty, especially for a science and engineering school. We are at 39% female. No, actually, we're almost 40% female because we were 39 out of 100 and one person left. So now we're 39 out of 99. We've worked very hard on race as, and you know, like when I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about this, I was going, so is 39 over 99 bigger or less than 40 over 100? It's less, it's too bad. Um, we have been working hard on race as well and, and, and also on our faculty. I will just say race is so much harder than gender. And you know, the reason, one of the reasons is that if we look at the percentage of uh, young, of people graduating from high school uh, with very strong academic preparation and achievement, the number of women is as large as the number of men. But if we look at it in terms of race, it's very different. And part of that is that the high schools in the United States, um, the quality of the teaching it's very dependent on the socioeconomic class of the district, of the neighborhood that a school was in. And so, you know, one of the things is, uh, as somebody who's Canadian, one of the reasons we moved back to Canada when our kids were three and six, I really wanted them to go to public schools. And I knew that if we moved back to Vancouver, it didn't matter what school they would be in, it would be an excellent school. And it's just not the case in the United States. So we've had to, in order to attract more Hispanic and black students to Harvey Mudd, we've had to work extremely hard, but I'm happy to say that we now actually are, uh, we're a minority, a majority minority campus now. 
So uh, about 30% um, of our students are white. So uh, one of the things that um, characterizes Harvey Mudd is that all of our students take the co current core curriculum, which is three semesters of math, two and a half of physics, uh, one and a third of chemistry, one semester of biology, one semester of CS, one of engineering, plus a half semester of a writing course and uh, humanities, social sciences, and the arts course. And you know, just to give you a sense of what these classes are like, uh, when I was at Princeton, I taught the second course in the three semester calculus sequence. And for most of the engineering students, that's the course that they started with because they had taken an AP calculus course before. And I was pretty stunned to discover arriving at Harvey Mudd that what gets done in the second and third semester at Princeton is what Harvey Mudd does in the first seven weeks. And so one of the things about these courses is they're very intense. Uh, we have, um, I would say, an overworked culture, both in our students, our faculty, our staff, and, and probably our alumni too, in that we just think we can always do better and always do more. Well before I arrived, so even before I'd been contacted about the possibility of moving to Harvey Mudd, the computer science department had noticed that the percentage of women, the percentage of students in their major who are female was very low. It was about 10%. Occasionally it would be 15, because it was always either two or three women, or occasionally one. And, um, and so they had decided uh, that they were gonna work on this, and every student at Harvey Mudd takes an introductory, well, takes a computer science course in their first semester. And at the time they decided to work on this, um, it wasn't a very popular course, except for the students who had been programming since they were young. So they redesigned uh, the CS core, and you know one of the things that has happened is within four years, they're 40% female, up from 10. And now they are roughly at 50% female. In 2015, our chemistry department decided to redesign their core, and their, the reason that they wanted to do that was they wanted to attract more majors. In the next year, engineering uh, launched a, a new version of their core, and the engineering class has taken its, its mathematical transform, so it was typically uh, Fourier transforms, and they had a 20-year record of the learning outcomes for that course, where for the, all 20 of those years, the male students outperformed the female students, and for the first 18 of the years, the difference was statistically significant. By the time they got to the last two years, it wasn't, even though it was a difference, it wasn't statistically significant. And the most important thing that I want to stress is, in no way was the content dumbed down. All of the rigor, all of the challenge remains. So let me talk about the computer science course. So, what students learn is the same. So what did they change? The first one was um, everybody talked to the course as this course is about learning to program in Java. It wasn't. It was about key concepts in computer science. But both the faculty and the students framed it as learning to program in Java. And so one thing they changed was how they talked about the course. And it is now described as creative, team-based problem solving in science and engineering using computational approaches with Python. So the whole idea, the whole reason you think you're learning this is so that you will understand this particular approach to problem solving. So there's another thing that happens really pretty often uh, in introductory computer science courses is that there are a few people who have really been programming for a very long time before they take this course. And they may be self-taught, they may be, have taken some online courses, but they are 
generally, if it's a good computer science course, they're absolutely thrilled to finally have somebody who knows more computer science than they do. And as a result, they ask a lot of questions and they answer a lot of questions. Now, when you're one of the other people in the class who's never programmed before, and you see some small number of typically geeky males, and I'll just make it clear, I really love geeky males. I'm married to one, my son is one. Uh, my daughter would say, I'm very geeky myself, so you know, I, it's, I'm not putting down geeky males. But they will get the feeling that everybody knows more than they do, and it's very intimidating. So if you've taken an intro CS class, raise your hand if you have had that experience. Being intimidated, yes, it's reasonably common. Um, so the computer science department decided that they would separate the students by prior experience. So CS5 gold, our colors are gold and black, and white, as you can probably tell. Um, they decided that they would make CS5 gold, and I think it's very important what they chose to be gold and what they chose to be black. Gold is for the people with no prior experience. Black is for the people with some prior experience. And then CS42 combines the first two courses in the sequence five and 60, um, and it's for the people who know way too much to be in an introductory course in the first place. So that, that's typically where those geeky guys go. But um, these days, uh, we're actually seeing CS42 having just about as many women in it as men. They're given a choice of assignments, and I, one of the things that, so for example, let's suppose they're doing uh, a software assignment uh, that's about recursion. They could choose to actually do one about modeling the spread of disease, so epidemi epidemiology. They could do one about billiard boards. They could, balls. They could do one about uh, robots who are running around a, a, a maze looking for green cheese. They're gonna do the same technical work, even though the model that they're simulating is slightly different. Um, we, one of those, we do a lot of pair programming, which is uh, best practice. And if you don't know what pair programming it is, is that you have a pair of people who are working on writing the software together. One of them is the driver. That's the person who's actually typing in the code. The other person is the navigator who's looking over the shoulder of the driver and asking questions, pointing out errors, making suggestions, et cetera. The important thing is you flip roles every half hour or so. And so most of our programming is actually done as pair programming in a, in a lab where we have one gruder, that's a Harvey Mudd word for greater tutor, we have one gruder for every eight students. Um, and the whole idea is we, we want you never to be in the situation where you're stuck on assignment and you just can't make any progress. And it's not that the gruders will tell you the answer, they will just try to ask the next question that will get you sort of moving in the right direction. Um, another thing they implemented was a modular approach. They, so the idea is um, generally sort of the, the ideas in the course come in maybe one week or two week modules. And the idea is that if you don't, if you didn't get or do well in this particular module, it's not gonna hamper you from really being able to sort of start over with the next concept. And then, the final thing is uh, what they refer to eliminating the macho effect. And so the macho effect is those people who are using up way too much of the airtime in the class. And what we know is that having people behave that way in a class is intimidating for many of the other students. And so I'm gonna ask Avi to come up. Come on, Avi. Um, Avi's a, this is Avi Victorson, he's a the theoretical computer scientist, and I don't actually think he started programming when he was four. Uh, it's a surprise for me. Yeah, he didn't know I was gonna do this. But she does things like this all the time. I know. <laughs> but anyhow, I, I picked on Avi because one of, he's one of my favorite people in the world, but also, Same thing. yeah, so I want him to be the geeky guy, so, um, and, and, <laughs> It's pretty good. I mean, if I had Yuval, I would use Yuval, yeah, but would yeah, he, he would be better, yes. Uh, he's a little old for the geeky guy in the intro class. Uh, so I'm teaching this class, and I have this wonderful student who is like one of the most passionate, brightest students I've ever worked with. 
but he talks too much. He asks too many questions, and he answers too many questions. I never did that. I know. That's baloney. <laughs> you talk a lot. So in any case, I have, have a meeting in my office, one-on-one -on -one with Avi, and I go, Avi, I love having you in my class. It's, you're one of the best students I've ever worked with. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> 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 but what you, um, what you probably don't realize is that when, and I love the questions you ask and the answers you give too, but you probably don't realize that many of the students in the class, they're just really scared that they don't know as much as you do. So I, I really want to keep on having conversations with you, but I'd love to do the one-on-one -on -one in office hours if that's okay with you. Sure. Anything you ask. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Round of applause. Now, you know, you might be thinking, you know, I'm teaching a class with 250 students in it, and how am I going to have time to have, and maybe I've got, you know, 15 of these geeky guys. How am I going to have time to have those conversations? So if, if you're teaching a huge class, then the conversations can absolutely easily be uh, with one of the TAs or whatever, but it's just, it's, I have yet to meet a geeky guy or woman who was monopolizing the airtime because they wanted to intimidate others. It's really, genuinely, they're so enthusiastic about the material. Okay, so um, it was one of the least popular courses, required courses. It became one of the most popular the very first time it was taught. Um, <laughs> By 2014, it became one of the five most popular courses in the Claremont Colleges. So one thing about Claremont is students can and do take courses at the other colleges. We have, in the history of our college, always been a debtor, nature, uh, debtor nation in that more of our students took courses at the other colleges than vice versa. We are now, whatever the opposite is, a donor nation maybe, in that we have more students coming to take classes at MUD, and it's all virtually all because of computer science. So we now teach roughly 600 uh, students introductory computer science. 60% um, of those students are not from Harvey Mudd. Now, it's not just enough to change uh, the first course. They, after they change the first course, of course, the students are enthusiastic about the next course because, I mean, they just love this, this course. And so we had to make sure um, that they had a similar kind of experience in the next two courses. We also increased summer research and internship opportunities for students in the summer after their first year, because one of the things we know from research is uh, women and students of color are more likely to stay in a major where they're underrepresented if they have early exposure to either research or internship, because it helps to see why what you've learned actually matters. And as I mentioned, uh, it just in the first four years, we went, we became 40% female. We're now at roughly 50%. And I want to say uh, one of the things I should mention here is we actually have three CS majors. Two of them are joint majors with the math department. One of them is known as CS Math, what a great name. And the other one is known as Math Comp Bio, which is basically mathematics, computer science, and biology. And in the only CS major, we're typically just right around 50%. In the math CS major, we're typically, I think, about between 30 and 40% female, which is very surprising to me because I think there should be more women in the math CS major. And in math comp bio, we're typically about two-thirds female. Okay. So I mentioned the engineering course. Um, this and, and how this had been a course where we saw for two decades gender differences in terms of the learning outcomes. So what the engineering department decided to do was um, they decided, they, they actually moved from Fourier to Laplace transforms because in terms of the application they wanted, Laplace was a better match. Um, they made several changes. So number one is they moved to flipped classrooms. So essentially, students are watching a 15-minute video on concepts on Sunday night. 
in the class on Monday, they first of all take an individual quiz followed by a team quiz just to assess whether they understood the concepts and partly also to ensure that they actually watched the video. And the grades from those quizzes have no, I mean, they're thrown away, nobody keeps track of them. It's just a way of having students understand what they understood and what they didn't understand. And so they continue on, on in the Monday class with doing team-based problem solving. The Wednesday class is also team-based problem solving on whatever the concept is. And then on Thursday or Friday, students are in uh, a lab and they, in that lab, they build an underwater robot and then for every concept they learn, they test the concept with the robot. And Again, it went from being one of the most disliked classes to one of the most popular. Uh, we had 20 years of data on learning outcomes, and lo and behold, they did better than any other class had done on the learning outcomes in the past. Men and women did equally well. Actually, the women's scores were higher than the men's scores, but it wasn't statistically significant, the difference. Um, but, you know, the thing I have to say is the engineering department spent two years redesigning this course. And, the, and even in the way they're teaching the class right now, it's much more faculty intensive than it was before, because before it was just a lecture course. And, um, you know, building underwater robots is not cheap, let me put it that way. So, let me come back to, is this relevant for anyone else? And, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, Harvey Mudd is a very unusual place. It is a very unusual place. So, the BRAID project, um, which stands for Building, Recruiting, and Inclusion for Diversity, one of the things about the changes that the CS department made is those changes, I mean, the underwater robot lab was expensive and, it, and teaching the engineering core course is expensive. But the changes that the CS department made and similar changes, with, uh, the first two places that actually started to do work on getting more women in computer science were Carnegie Mellon University with Jay Margolis and Alan Fisher and the University of British Columbia and that's work that I was involved with. They did very similar things and in fact there has been, there is a center called the NCWIT, the National Center for Women in Information Technology and they have excellent materials on how to change things in your CS department in order to attract more women and students of color. And yet when we look at the natural landscape, there are perhaps a dozen or 20 institutions that actually have significantly worked on implementing these kinds of things. And so in 2014, I was giving a talk at uh, to about 250 uh, department chairs, computer science department chairs at Snowbird, which is the biannual conference uh, for computer science department chairs. And I was talking about, I used six examples of institutions that had managed to dramatically increase the percentage of women in their CS major. University of Washington, University of British Columbia, MIT, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and Harvey Mudd. One more, Carnegie Mellon. And I pointed out that the things that people had done were very similar and they were essentially, they had changed their intro course along the lines I just described. They had worked to build confidence community among underrepresented groups in their department. They had done outreach to high school teachers and students and many of them were offering joint or double majors with computer science. And it occurred to me that since we all know what needs to be done, that the missing ingredient was probably because there wasn't leadership in the department that was really pushing in this direction. 
And so I, on the spur of the moment, decided to make the offer to um, the first 10 department chairs who decided they wanted to do this, that I would help them raise funding uh, for their department to take their students to conferences like the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. And by the time I finished my talk, there were 15 department chairs who had signed up within like 30 seconds of each other. So I said, okay, fine, I'll take 15 of them. Um, I reached out to Facebook, Google, Microsoft, and Intel and uh, lined up money. Um, they each committed 150000 a year for three years. Uh, very early on, um, Brad Smith, who was the president of Microsoft, said, you know, Maria, actually, first of all, you should partner with somebody else so that the companies can just give all the money to that somebody else rather than having to give it to individual institutions. Well, part of that was I was on the Microsoft board and he didn't want to give it to Harvey Mudd College because that would be a conflict of interest as a board member. And so I partnered with AnitaB.org. Um, but Brad also said, you know, Maria, it'd be really good if you would actually recruit some researchers to study what happens in these departments. And so I did a phone call with Jane Margolis and uh, who's at UCLA, and she said, oh, I'm too busy leading Explore CS project, but I have this colleague at UCLA, Linda Sachs, and she's fantastic, and maybe she'd be interested in doing it. So the next day I had a phone call with Linda Sachs, and I've worked with uh, people who do educational research a number of times in my life before, so I was sort of ready for Linda's reaction, which is extreme suspicion. And I, because I think what happens a lot is uh, you, you have mathematicians or computer scientists or others who are doing things, and we reach out to our colleagues who actually study educational transformation, and they think, well, I guess they have a lot of experience with the scientists really not respecting what they bring uh, to the experience and, and so on and so forth. And, but however, I talked her into at least considering it, and a couple of days later, uh, she said yes. And I, so our project, uh, because we only had $600,000 a year that we're spreading among uh, 15 different departments, um, we were only giving 70K per year to uh, Linda Sachs's team. Well, within a few months, she had gotten an NSF grant for $1.9 million <laughs> for this project, and they just got another million-dollar grant from Pivotal Ventures, which is Melinda Gates' new uh, effort. And the bottom line is, um, this is the first of kind of research that's ever been done uh, like this, where because they managed to start working with the departments right as they started changing things. And they also have been able to do uh, studies of students in the introductory uh, computer science class, and then they are able to follow them through the next four years and see whether who decides to be majors, who doesn't, what do they end up doing, all those kinds of things. And uh, we just, um, we're now in the, have completed about six months of the second three years in this project. And what's really quite extraordinary is that, uh, you know, when you think about these departments, they, most of them had to redesign their intro course. And so that means that that new course is not gonna be taught until probably the beginning of the second year. And nevertheless, at the end of three years, we had seen significant increases uh, in the number of women and in the number of student, uh, students of color. And one of the things that's interesting about this is many of you probably know that there is a boom in computer science going on right now, and the number of majors is growing uh, extraordinarily fast at almost every university that hasn't ca capped it. And, and this was happening in our braid departments as well. But if you compared the growth in women, that was close to, uh, women had gone up roughly 60% in the major over the three-year period. Whereas, whereas white males had gone up 22%. And, 
and people of color had gone up, students of color had gone up 38%. So I, it's really you know, quite remarkable that in such a short period of time, we'd really see that much difference. So I am going to um, open it up for questions. I guess I'll moderate here. Uh, if you have questions, there are uh, uh, microphones. I guess there's one here, and I don't know if there's one on that side. Oh, there is one there. I have a question. Um, oh. With the acknowledgement of the additional time that f and effort that faculty have to take to uh, teach in some of the and develop these courses, is there some recognition in the rank tenure promotion process for that kind of work? Great question. And you know, one of the things I absolutely love about Harvey Mudd is we put so much value on innovation in terms of both pedagogy and curriculum. And so when people come up for tenure, we consider, like most other places, uh, they're teaching, but by teaching, we really are thinking very broadly in terms of, I mean, really, most of our faculty innovate in terms of curriculum and pedagogy. Um, so it's that as, in addition uh, to their teaching evaluations and other kinds of things. We consider scholarly work, but that scholarly work, so for instance, uh, Daryl Young, who's in our, a full professor in our math department, um, at, his scholarly work is largely around professional development for K-12 math teachers. So, you know, and in our CS department, Colleen Lewis, her research area is CS pedagogy and curriculum from zero to infinity. So yes, we take that very seriously and then service as well. One quick follow-up question. So the institutions who are part of BRAID, do you think that they're going to acknowledge this work in the same way? Or are they even thinking about this issue? I, you know, it's something that we have an annual summit for the chairs of the braid departments. And we have talked, uh, uh, I mean, one of the questions that is as department chairs is, how do you actually encourage your faculty to want to do things? And it's my sense that within their departments, there is real acknowledgement. What I can't really speak to is whether at the dean's level above the department, it is being taken as seriously. But I have visited a number of the institutions and spoken with the deans. So, you know, I, I, if I could wave a magic wand, I would make every math department, every computer science department care as much about teaching and education as they care about research because I truly think that the work that we do in terms of educating our students is as important as the papers that we publish. Can you please talk about the interaction of these curricular changes with admissions, by which I mean how do prospective students find out about the innovative changes you've made to the core curriculum? Ah, well, first of all, uh, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, we try to make sure that everything that we do, whether it's our website, our admission materials, um, actually talks about the fact that we treasure innovation in curriculum and pedagogy. And, um, but you know, one of the things that happened is uh, I, I realized, one of the things I didn't understand when I moved from Princeton to Harvey Mudd was that Harvey Mudd was really not nearly as well known as I thought it was. And I think I knew about math, Harvey Mudd because I was a mathematician, but um, turns out most of the world didn't know. And so I actually had a meeting with Sheryl Sandberg, who's the COO of Facebook, in 20, June 2011, where I told her what we had, our faculty in computer science had done to attract more women and how successful it had been. And she was really enthusiastic. And I said, well, Cheryl, you can help. You should talk about us. And so within the next 12 months, we had 
60 stories in the media. We were in the New York Times, we were on PBS NewsHour, we were in Time Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, as one of the ways to get the word out that this is something that we do, that we care about women, that we care about people of color, and actually becoming better known was one of the things that helped us to essentially almost triple the number of black students we have uh, attending Harvey Mudd now. We'll go next in the back. So how do you, uh, do you, do you see ways or approaches to, to translate the increased number of, you know, the increased women and uh, p people of color as undergraduate majors into faculty members, and how quickly can that happen? Oh, that's a great question. So roughly 30 so percent. Just a, one follow-up is, I just did an informal survey of websites of statistics departments last year. I was just curious as to, surely there must be a large percentage of female faculty at research statistics institutions, and my informal sur survey indicated that wasn't true. Right. So the first thing I want to say is that if you look at representation of women in top math departments, top statistics departments, top computer science departments, it tends to be low. And the more prestigious the institution, the lower it tends to be. And that is just very, and it's true for chemistry and biology, even though those fields have been more than 50% female at the undergraduate level for quite a long time and have very good representation uh, in PhD programs and even in postdoc programs. So one of the things we have done at Harvey Mudd um, since, well, really over the last 10 years is train our search committees on how to recruit a diverse pool of candidates, how to interview a diverse pool of candidates effectively, how to negotiate with diverse candidates. I mean, there's an awful lot about how we do the business of recruiting in academia that um, has a lot of unconscious bias. And I mean, there's just so many studies that show that. So it's not just that we need to get more women and, and people of color to go to graduate school and get PhDs. What we really need to do is change how we recruit. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I, I think that it has to be something that it's not something that a president can do. Let me, let me say that presidents, no matter how passionate they are about diversity, they're not, you cannot, as a president, make your faculty do anything. <laughs> In fact, if you ask your faculty to do something, let alone tell your faculty to do something, it's likely that the opposite will happen. So, what you can do as president is you can offer opportunities for faculty to become passionate about things and give help to raise the resources that empowers faculty to actually make changes. And so, you know, when I, when I think about, you know, what has happened at Harvey Mudd, the most important thing I did as the computer science department chair who was chair at the time when I arrived, came to my office last summer and he said, Maria, you were really smart. And I went, about what? And he goes, you knew we were trying to uh, get, change things to get more women to major in computer science. And even though you knew a lot about it, you never told us to do anything. And I said, yeah, I have learned. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, uh, we do need to make changes. And I, I actually, I, I mean, one of the good things is that faculty can play a huge role in actually making those changes happen. Take uh, one more question here. Um, as the number of uh, the percentage of women and people of color increase in those majors that you mentioned at the Braid institutions and at your own, are majors in other fields decreasing? Are people double majoring? Is there pushback from the departments who may be losing majors to the STEM majors? Uh, so. We are a STEM institution, so I, I would say, you know, the situation for us is, um, you know, there, there are two departments who have lost a lot of majors, it's chemistry and biology, and part of that is 
we're not a place where pre-med students tend to go, and many chemistry and biology majors are pre-med, and so that is part of that. That is actually one of the reasons that chemistry redesigned their core course, and I think they are attracting more majors. So what seems to have happened is that I, I do think uh, one of the reasons that engineering decided to resign, redesign their core courses, we had a year where we had more CS majors than engineering majors graduate, and engineering has always been by far the largest major at Harvey Mudd. And so I, I would say, I mean, one of the things is we don't admit to a major, students can pick whatever major they want at the end of, by the end of their sophomore year. And so at least at our institution, it seemed to have has spurred innovation and, and, and really good changes in other departments. I do know at places where, you know, which are universities that cover the entire range of disciplines that, um, are, and even small liberal arts colleges, there are certainly people who think that the uh, flow of students into computer science, whether it's joint majors or just computer science, is a terrible thing because they're flowing away from the humanities and um, other areas. But I think as we look at where the world is today and where it's going to be in the next decade or so, virtually every student is going to need, every graduate, whether you're in literature or French or philosophy or econ, you're going to need more math and computer science because data science is changing the way every single part of our society works. And so I don't see that demand going away. What I do think we're going to need to think very hard about is you know, how we compete with industry to keep faculty who want to teach because um, the salaries in industry are, start out at you know, at least 50% higher, and then they go, they increase much more rapidly. Let's thank, thank you. Uh, President Clave again.